Hello and welcome back to the workshop where we're going to be discussing a whole bunch of Vetteles. Now this is actually going to be a two-part episode because uh, there's an awful lot to say. Um, so this part one will be about the history and mechanics and part two will be discussing briefly the, the major differences between uh, the infantry rifles. I'm only dealing with the infantry rifles here and uh, a bit of shooting. Uh, there will also be a Mad Minute published at some point separately. Anyway, if you're here for the shooting, um, this episode doesn't have any. Sorry. So before we get stuck in, I thought I'd give you a little teaser of the collection here. The top one here in the nice dark wood is a model 1869-70. So this is pretty much the first, let's say, generalized issue rifle after all the prototypes and trials. And uh, then below here, we have the model 1869-71 rifle which is basically a rationalized version of this and there's certain things i didn't like on this one they got rid of and then below we have a slightly shorter 1871 stutzer rifle so this was intended for the sharpshooters it has a nice set trigger and a curved butt plate then we continue down here to my uh, range rifle which is my uh, 1878 infantry rifle. You have a new rear sight, new trigger guard, and now everybody gets a butt plate with a curve in it. Then down below we have the model 1881 infantry rifle. It's slightly modified rear sight. Apart from that, essentially the same as the 78 model. And then Last but not least, we have the model 1881 Stutzer, which is the same as the uh, infantry rifle, except we have a set trigger. And here we have a selection of bayonets. Now, I'm not going to go too much into bayonets, it's not really my thing, but uh, I agree that they should belong to the rifles. So, like all good origin stories, it's best to start right back at the beginning. Um, now, I've gone into some detail about the Swiss historical military perspective uh, in the late 1860s in the Milbank Armsler video, which is linked in the description, but we're going to assume here that none of you have seen it. Um, so the situation is that there is a, a decree by the Federal Assembly in, uh, on 20th of July 1866, where it is stated that the uh, sharpshooters and the infantry of both the elite, so the currently serving troops and the reserve, will be equipped with repeating rifles. Now, what um, what caused Switzerland to leapfrog from um, muzzle-loading percussion rifles to breech-loading repeaters? Basically, it's the rowdy neighbours, because two weeks before this decree was the Battle of Königgrätz, which was the Prussian Empire against the Austrian Empire with the uh, Prussians coming out on top. Uh, now, this conflict was very, very seriously uh, monitored by the Swiss because uh, they didn't know whether this was, conflict was going to continue. And bordering both empires, there's every possibility that it could spill over into Switzerland. So this sort of uh, spurred a hasty requirement for some more modern weaponry. Now, obviously, not even the Swiss could have planned things perfectly and have a clean-cut transition between muzzle loaders and repeating rifles, uh, but they did have a well-established modernization plan, uh, which started for the sharpshooters, so the ones that were, let's say, honoured and expected to make the most use of the new technology. Uh, they got the Peabody rifle, so bought wholesale from the US, and there was also the conversion plan of the old infantry rifles, because we don't want to waste money, uh, to the Milbank Armsler system. So even the old rifles were recycled, but this was fully intended to be a stopgap while the repeating rifle was either found or developed. So while the decree of July 1866 confirms the transition to repeating rifles, the Swiss had been keeping tabs on developments uh, before that date. Uh, they'd been perfectly aware of the various developments made in that direction during the American Civil War, and they were particularly impressed by the Henry rifle. 
And so they kept tabs on what was happening with that, and then eventually they transitioned to the Winchester Rifle Company. Uh, so much so that in January of 1866, so prior to the battle and the decree, they had already uh, tested some what were essentially prototypes of the 1866 model Winchester. Uh, they were suitably impressed by these and uh, they were sort of kept on the sidelines such that on the 12th of October of 1866, so now after the battle and the confirmation to, trans to, uh, to transition, uh, they proposed to put an order down for 8,000 repeating rifles of the 1866 pattern to equip uh, the sharpshooters. They're still getting first dibs at this stage. Then there seems to be a lot of debate and ultimately, uh, they say, you know what, why just limit our order for the sharpshooters? Uh, let's put an order down to 90 to 110,000 rifles from the, right from the get-off to equip the whole army. Uh, now, the condition for that is that they must be able to be, to be produced in Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland at the time is basically an agricultural economy with very limited industrial means. And this would be a uh, means to sort of switch over to increase the industrial base. Now that means that Winchester has to be able to produce the machinery for the domestic production. Um, now at this point, um, basic research that I've done goes two ways depending on which side you're looking at. Uh, the Swiss side basically says, well, we put down this tender and order and Winchester said, uh, sorry, no, we don't have the machinery available, nor will it be available anytime soon, but we can do you a deal on Henry's. Uh, which isn't what they wanted. And on the American side, it seems to be that they, the, they were waiting for the Swiss to confirm and waited and waited and waited until in the end they said, no, just forget it. They're obviously not interested. We'll go on to other things. What really happened, I haven't been really able to find any documents to prove one or the other. Um, so the, uh, the end of, the, uh, of all that story is that the Swiss finally decide well, the only solution now is to find a domestic rifle instead. So all these important dates and events and still no mention of uh, Friedrich Vettel himself, this fine bearded gentleman here. Uh, now he'd been working at SIG since 1864. Uh, in fact, SIG only had an arms division since 1860. Um, so yes, he'd been coaxed from the United, United Kingdom where he'd already been working in um, production engineering for firearms. In fact, he was recruited back by SIG because he proposed uh, an improvement in the uh, manufacturing of bayonets. And SIG said, awesome, but we want you back here to work for us because you're good. Um, so he'd um, studied in, uh, so in the United Kingdom, also in Paris, Saint-Étienne. Uh, he travelled quite willingly and seemed to be reasonably well connected with the, the other gunsmiths, arms developers of the period. Um, and in fact, by 1866, we have the basic bolt action itself. Uh, the problem we had was to merge that with the lifter mechanism of the tube magazine. Uh, now, some of you may question how Switzerland was able to just basically copy the, uh, um, the Henry or Winchester uh, tube magazine system. And the simple answer is, uh, Switzerland didn't have a patenting system then. It didn't start until uh, 1888. So until then, you couldn't protect your invention in Switzerland and anything could be used by Switzerland. So uh, no IP problems there at all. Anyway, uh, there is a funny anecdote by the director of the uh, SIG firearms division at the time, Mr. Burnot, who was actually uh, responsible for the transition, the Swiss transition to percussion and the first rifled muskets. He was rewarded with, a, with the uh, control of the firearms division for his efforts. Uh, anyway, he describes that uh, at some point in uh, 1867, in bounds Vettel into his office saying, oh, Eureka, I found it. And of course, this is the shape of the lifting mechanism, which connects the bolt, the linear action of the bolt, with the vertical travel of uh, the lifting mechanism. So he finally clinched uh, that difficult conundrum. Uh, however, it still wasn't plain sailing. That was, didn't mean that the miracle rifle was there, bam, and it would be adopted straight away. Uh, the Swiss were still mulling over the different designs, still testing other systems as well. Um, so much so that um, even in October of 1867, 
uh, there is a very frustrated officer writing in the uh, military review that they still don't know what they're going to get. Is it going to be this new Vetterli? It could still be a Winchester or it could be something completely different. Um, apparently Mr. Armsler, so the uh, gentleman responsible for the Millbank Armsler um, conversion was very much uh, on vogue with the military gentlemen of the time, of the uh, heads of head chiefs of staff and so forth in the, in the Swiss military. And he basically had carte blanche to decide whatever he wanted with firearms. So even he might pluck something out of thin air and say that. Now, thankfully that poor officer didn't have to wait too long. Um, just a couple of months because the rifle is uh, finally approved by the Federal Council on the 27th of February, 1868. Um, and then a tender is uh, brought out for the production of the rifles. So SIG won't be able to cover the production itself. All of the production, we need, they need about 80,000 rifles. Um, so they've put out a tender for other firearms manufacturers within Switzerland, of course. Um, however, it's not quite so simple because during the first field trials, various little niggling points appear, uh, weaknesses, and all these build up and of course all these changes will therefore mean changes in the production machinery um, if you couple that with the need to collaborate between Vetterli himself uh, the various military authorities government authorities and the future um, manufacturers this just builds up a massive delay in production uh, so much so that um, there's so much time involved that uh, the 1st of August there is a new pattern approved 1st of August of 1869, which is then has to be approved by the military, which comes only in the 30th of December of 1869. Um, and the result is that uh, at the uh, in May of 1870, SIG has produced 60 rifles. Not very good. Uh, of course, then the pace builds up. Um, Valentin Saubre uh, from Basel is the first uh, subcontractor which joins in and that means that end at the end of 1870 they are up to just over 2000 uh, end of 1871 uh, they have now seven manufacturers up and running and they're already up to 30,000 more or less so as I just mentioned by 1871 there were seven manufacturers up and running um, in the end there are ten so I'll just quickly run through them uh, in chronological order and show you the, the receiver markings. Uh, so in 1870, we have both SIG and uh, Valentin Sauerbre in Basel. Then in 1871, we've got a big influx. We've got Cordier et Compagnie, Bellefontaine in Bern. We have W. von Steiger in Thun. I have no idea what the W is, most probably Walter. Then we have the Ostschweizerische Buchsenmacher, St. Gallen. Then we have two manufacturers from Aarau. We have uh, Richner and Keller. Then we have Zeughaus Zurich. Now I don't have a receiver marking for that one because they don't seem to have one. Uh, this was the, the cantonal arsenal. So there was just the cantonal stamp on the barrel. And uh, last one in 1871 is von Erlach in Thun. And then in 1872, we have Montier Werkstatt Bern which then transitions to uh, Waffenfabrik Bern. And there's one more, uh, Rudolf Fenninger in Steffa. Um, I haven't found information on that particular manufacturer. Uh, it exists, but I don't know what they made or how many. Now, um, we're gonna quit looking at my face and we're gonna start looking at this now because we're coming to the uh, disassembly and explanation of how the Vetterli works. Um, I've chosen this one because it's the earliest model I have and it's got a few bits and bobs on it which later disappear. So, let's take it apart. So I have disassembled the rifle as far as we need it. Um, this has not been cleaned within an inch of its life because I uh, like to retain the nice patina that these have built up. Uh, even the dried grease, if it's not impinging function, there's no reason to remove it, it's doing a good job. So uh, if you have one of these in such a condition, hunt for any spots of rust, obviously, and then leave it be. So let's start with the magazine system, which is all contained in the forend. So we have a magazine, a brass sleeve here, which extends all the way down. 
And in there we have the follower spring, the follower here, the big plunger, and this knurled cap here, which is screwed in to the end of the magazine tube. And that retains the follower so it doesn't shoot out into the receiver once the magazine's empty. And it also ensures that particularly the last cartridge has been pushed out far enough once it's mounted in the receiver. Um, it's a good job that they used uh, an in a complete brass tube and not just rely on a bore inside the forend, like for example on the label, uh, because that means uh, that there's no chance of the follower getting stuck due to uh, warping of the wood uh, due to weather, particularly uh, a damp Swiss autumn or winter up on the mountains um, that can then squeeze on the magazine tube and then catch the follower. I've had this happen to my label and it's a real pain to uh, free up the magazine again. So here we have the uh, the follower and the cartridge is nicely isolated inside a brass tube and there's no risk of that happening. So now we come to the barrel receiver. Now concerning the barrel there's not much to say, uh, it's just a barrel. Concerning the rear sight, we'll come to that when we discuss the various models of them because they change over time. Uh, so the receiver is machined from a solid chunk. Uh, at the back here we've got this nice double tang, which allows a proper clamping of the wrist of the rifle, which is also pretty chunky, so it gives a good solid mount for it. And it also houses the trigger assembly, which is pretty basic. Now the main body of the receiver has two main parts. We've got the upper tubular bit which houses the bolt. Obviously also has the uh, opening for the lifter. And we've got this little wedge here, a key, which is very cleverly captive because soldiers would lose it otherwise. Uh, this has two jobs. Firstly it acts as a bolt stop for when opening the bolt and it also uh, is part of the safety because it uh, only allows the bolt to close when it's fully forward. So uh, we'll come to that when we explain the bolt function. And obviously at the back we have the two locking surfaces. Now despite what it looks like they are integrally machined in the tubular bit. They, don't, they look a bit like they're separate elements but they are all one. Uh, they are just basically rectangles, you can see here. There's no slope surfaces or camming surfaces on the, on the front of, uh, of the, uh, the locking surfaces here, like for example, Mass 36. So it's just straight up and down when you lock it. On the lower part, this sort of a rectangle, we have the opening for the magazine at the front and the big opening for the lifter, which is, and we're going up and down. And we also have space for the rocking arm for the lifter. We'll get to that in a sec. Um, obviously then we have the opening for feeding the magazine. Uh, no King's Gate on this. Uh, all we have for now on this model is this flimsy little bit of uh, spring steel which uh, covers up the opening here and there's a little slot machined into the receiver wall just to keep it nice and tight up against the uh, the side here. On the other side we have some little slots machined here and uh, divots and that is for the magazine cutoff also present on this early model. I'll explain how that works once the rifle's back together I think it's better just to show you rather than attempt to describe it. Right, mag cutoff's back on the receiver. Now let's just see how it works. Um, basically it has two positions um, which are indexed by this little um, indent here in the steel plate which matches two indents uh, on the receiver. So this is a lowered position and this is a raised position. Not much difference between the two. And this little bit here is a rivet uh, which is part of the arm, which you can see down there, all the way down there. So this bit gets raised or lowered depending on the position. So here it's on the in the lowered 
I'll put it in load position, which means you can load the magazine normally if the lifter was here and the cartridge goes in and out. There's no, uh, there's no retainer. And if I raise the cutoff, then the rim is just, just caught by the arm there of the cutoff lever. Um, it's only barely functional. I can understand why they got rid of it fairly soon because it's really, I mean, this together with the dust cover here, they really smack of someone high up demanding the features to be there. And Vettelie did his absolute minimum to satisfy the requirements. Um, so now I can lower it and the uh, cartridge will probably shoot out. There we go. Okay, so the lifter. Now I'll show you it operating in the rifle in a second, but I thought I'd show you the part because it is actually far more complex than we think and it's quite a feat of manufacturing at the time. Um, it's a bit more complex than the, the uh, Winchester 1866 lifter, although it operates basically in the same way. Um, underneath here we've got an opening for the camming arm, which was a better least Eureka moment. So this, the longer arm sits in there and it's got its bistable positions here, which is uh, done due to this spring and uh, this sur coming surface here on the back. So you have a lowered stable position and a raised stable position. And that movement is controlled by a slot on the underside of the body. So in the rearward position it pulls backwards, hits the forward end of the slot and in the forward position once it's closed it lowers it again. Now then we have here this cylindrical opening here which is where the cartridge will uh, be fed in and also pushed back out by the magazine. Raised, level with the, uh, with the uh, chamber and fed in. And upon extraction, when this is lower down, the case rides along this guide surface on the top here. And when you're operating it in a soldierly fashion, the rim then falls into this, these two scalloped openings here. And with the extractor claw, flips out the case. And this is all combined with raising as well, obviously, as I said, if operating in a soldierly fashion. Uh, another interesting point is this slope surface on the front. And you can see here, it's not completely flat. And that ensures that um, the follower or uh, the base of a cartridge sticking a little bit into uh, the, reset, the opening for the lifter gets, just gets pushed back into the magazine tube. All right, got a couple in the mag. So that's how it sits there. Um, now it's a bit odd to see the back of the cartridge just exposed like that, um, but it's being pushed up hard against the back surface there. Uh, and of course the cartridge column or the follower. So it actually goes nowhere, which basically why they rendered this uh, silly flimsy piece of steel here utterly useless. All right, leave it here for now. So when we look down into the mag, we can see that the rim of the next cartridge is actually poking in to the mag well. As I said, this isn't an issue because of that sloped surface on the front of the lifter, which is gonna push that one back into the magazine. And you can see disappeared and magwell's clear so then we chamber last bit of uh, travel it's uh, the bolt is going to tilt the uh, lever arm snap down the lifter next cartridge is ready to go now, i'm not going to fire it because these 
printed cartridges uh, break uh, when you hit them with the uh, with the rim fire firing pin. But um, I'm just going to close it so that the extractor clips over the rim. And there you can see the striker has been cocked, spring here compressed. So when we come to open the bolt, and we unlock that cock on opening there. Now I'm going to do this slowly. Here we've got the extractor claw, which is guiding the case on the top surface of the lifter. And there it's dropped into those two scoops. Now, of course, because I've done it slowly, the cartridge has dropped and therefore disengaged from the uh, extractor claw. That's not actually a problem though, because when you keep on working the bolt back, it just pushes it out vertically. So instead of flipping it away, it just shoves it up and out. So I'll do it at speed. I'll just drop this slowly because these things don't like the uh, the rim fire pins, the, the rims snap. So let's this time do it in a soldierly fashion. Open the bolt and out it shoots. Now one feature I forgot to point out because I didn't have the lifter in there is if you have a model which has or had uh, the cutoff, your lifter has a little cutout here, which is where the little arm pokes in to work on the magazine tube. Um, so that's where this comes from. It is not a, a defect or a missing a part. Um, all it's missing is this, which um, depending on what condition your rifle is in, it's perfectly normal for this not to be present anymore. And finally we come to the bolt. Now this is also a rather complex part, but I'm sure we'll get through it. So the first bit is the main cylindrical body. Um, nothing much to say about it. Uh, something to note for later is this ring here. Uh, something to note is that it is actually has a shallow ramp on the rear surface here, which will be significant in a bit. So keep that in mind. And the other main part is uh, the bolt handle and locking lug assembly. Now this is actually two parts. And you can see in the lights there, we've got the outer, the outer ring and then the inner bushing. Um, this was made as two parts up to the uh, model of 1878, in which they then have made uh, some uh, advances in machining and then are able to make this as one part. So at the front, we have the two locking lugs. As I said, the locking surfaces are straight. No camming going on here when this is being locked or unlocked. Uh, there is this ramp here, which is to be uh, remembered as this one, because they're going to interact later. And we also have this little keyway, another feature to remember. And on the back, we have these two ramps, which are for cocking the striker. Uh, so this is cock on opening. Now the striker itself is interesting because it's in two parts. We have the main firing pin effectively, and we have this pronged striker head. Now it's made in two parts principally because otherwise you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to put it in there. Uh, it would be extremely difficult to machine. And secondly, this is a rimfire rifle. We've got a big, heavy rim on the cartridge here. So uh, since this was the early days of uh, ammunition manufacturing, uh, reliability was far, far less than it is today. So why not double your chances by striking the rim twice? And you can see on this old one here. So that's the uh, striker assembly. Another very important part is the extractor and because it does far more than just extract. So we've got the claw here at the front and we have this step at the back, which uh, is going to interact with the key here uh, as the bolt stop. 
And note at the back here that we have this sort of upward ramp and then a little tongue here. Now something very important about this piece is that it is extremely brittle uh, and luckily it doesn't need to be bent or deflected in any way to put it in or take it out of the bolt. So you just slot it in to its groove here and then you just push it forward and it gently clicks into place. Likewise to remove it, just pull it back gently and lift it out. Otherwise it's going to snap like a dry piece of spaghetti. Trust me, I know. So none of this trying to raise the, uh, the nose up and over. It's not necessary. So this is how it's sitting with a cartridge. So I'll just assemble it and then uh, discuss how it works as we go. <clears throat> so fork goes in sideways, usually goes in better one side than the other. I don't know why, I haven't seen any asymmetry between uh, the openings, but it's just how it is. Then we put the bolt assembly, the uh, bolt knob assembly on there. When you're putting this back together outside of the rifle, uh, it's easier if you have the bolt in a locked position, so to speak. So the bolt down, parallel with the flat sides of the uh, of the bolt body here, which means that the striker can be in its most forward position, which makes it easier for then putting the, straight, the spring and the bolt cap on. Now you can see here it's a cock on opening. It's also nice that it's, uh, it's two surfaces, so it makes cocking easier rather than having to put everything onto one ramp uh, and surface on the striker. So this is the mainspring, which is enormous and pretty strong. Uh, of course, it gives a good hard strike, but it also has another function, which I discovered while researching for this vid, actually, through observation, which we'll come to in a sec. Now, there is also this bolts, uh, this spring sleeve. Uh, this is purely for protecting the spring. It doesn't have any other mechanical function. So I'll leave it off for now, so you can see how everything's working. And this is the bolt cap, which screws onto the bolt body. Why is that significant? You'll see, so I'll just put it enough. I don't want to tension the mainspring too much and make my life more difficult. So um, this means that the uh, lever assembly and locking lugs are actually still able to slide relative to the main body. And that will come, become important in a second. Anyway, so here we would have a locked position. Now to unlock it, we would raise the uh, bolt handle, which will rotate relative to the main body. And what's happened here is that the tongue at the back of um, the extractor has gone into the groove inside the uh, locking lug part here and now the two parts are locked together. So now you can pull the action the, the bolt back. That's going to go back inside the uh, receiver until it hits this part here, hits the keyway. Sorry, the key. So you have a, a positive bolt stop here. That of course uh, lifts up the lifter, does its job. When you push the bolt home again, the key is going to ride along the back of the uh, extractor spring leaf and push down on this ramp surface and until the bolt is fully forward and at that point <clears throat> the tongue drops out of engagement with the groove inside the locking part here and allows you to lock the bolt. So until that moment you cannot physically lock the bolt closed which is a, a very clever solution. So there's one more feature of the bolt that I would like to show you um, and I've seen mentioned nowhere else. Uh, I said that the uh, locking surfaces and locking lugs don't have any camming action, no primary extraction, 
because their locking surfaces are perpendicular to the bolt axis. So locking or unlocking does nothing whatsoever uh, for primary extraction. But there is actually a spring powered uh, primary extraction. I'll just show you what is responsible for that. So cast your minds way back to the disassembly of the bolt and I said that there was a little ramp, helical ramp here on this ring on the bolt body and a corresponding one at the front of the, let's call it, the bolt hub, let's call it. So that means that the distance between them changes as the bolt is opened or closed. So here the ramps are twisting away from each other. So the two parts are actually getting further apart. And in this position, these two parts are closer together. That means there's relative movement. Remember, the, this can slide along the bolt body. So if we put that now into the receiver, in this case, when we lock down the bolt, the bolt hub is the static part in this case, which means that when we lock it in this position, the, uh, the two ramps are turning away from each other, which means that the bolt body is being cammed forward because this hub can't go anywhere due to the locking uh, surfaces. And of course, inversely, when we open the bolt, those ramps are turning into each other and the distance shortens, but uh, the bolt can't go anywhere, which means the bolt body moves back. So we do have primary extraction and I can prove it by putting a line just on the nose of the extractor claw here. And when I open it without unlocking, so there, just, it's not open yet, but I've just rotated the bolt slightly and you can see I hope you can. There we've got about a millimeter of travel. So we have about a millimeter of primary extraction. Then the bolt is unlocked and we carry on. So it's, uh, it's not much. And actually there's quite a lot of pressure because you have just cocked the striker. So the spring is uh, under immense tension and it's pushing between the striker, which is retained by the sear and the bolt cap here. So it's actually pulling back with quite a lot of force. And it's certainly sufficient for these light um, copper foil cases. So I hope that was vaguely understandable. It took me ages to figure out the, what these two surfaces were doing because there's obviously a reason for going through all that effort of machining it, yet um, the technical literature doesn't say anything about it, which is a bit odd. So uh, deduction prevailed there. Now, um, one thing I wanted to address before we uh, leave the rest to part two is where this bolt actually comes from. Um, all the literature, even the German Bible, just has a quick line saying it's uh, he combined the uh, Kalischer from the Kalischer and Terry carbine system with the Dreiser. Um, obviously, that was coined by someone back in the day, and it's just been cut and paste henceforth. Uh, I don't quite agree with that. It's a little bit too lazy, I think. It's like calling all front-locking bolt-action rifles Mauser-type actions. <coughs> Lebel was first. Um, so, Kalischer system, you can see here, we have, uh, it's a capping breech loader. We have a bolt with two locking lugs, which lock inside the receiver, and we've got a funny articulated um, bolt knob, which also caps the loading window very clever um but yeah it's it's just saying look there's a there's a there's a bolt with some bolt lugs so he had to deduce uh his his version from that um i have an alternative especially considering that he was uh studying and working both in paris and saint etienne before moving to england um i suspect that perhaps he was aware or was in communication with alphonse chaspeau because if we look at his capping breech loader, model 1858, 
1862, the bolt doesn't really change. You can see nice big square um, locking lugs and also the back of the receiver looks remarkably similar. It's a hypothesis, I can't prove anything. Um, and as to the dryzer part, I think that's even lazier because, um, well, I happen to have one here. Basically the only thing it has in common is that it has an internal striking system. The fact that it's a bolt action um, doesn't really inspire much. Uh, at the time, there were many bolt action type capping breech loaders. Um, and even internal strikers were becoming a thing with the early cartridge loaders. I mean, this is a very, very early system. Um, it's really not a good base for uh, assuming that uh, Vettel got his idea from this. Um, I think that uh, it was a homegrown invention of his own design. Um, as I said, all this is a hypothesis, but um, it fits far better than just saying Kalasher plus Dreiser. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we can't chase up any of this because when Vettel died, um, 1880, Two, I believe. Um, his British bride took all of his goods and belongings back to England. Uh, so we don't know what happened to it, so his notes and, and all that have disappeared. Anyway, um, I think that'll do for part one. Uh, there's a lot of information there. I hope I've managed to get it across clearly enough. Um, Part two will focus on uh, the different models of the infantry rifles, talk a little bit about um, the ammunition, and then I'll see if I can find some nice shooting footage for you. So, thank you for your attention, and I hope you'll be back for part two. Bye!